be on the chief cornerstone. And I'll give y'all a pop quiz tonight. One question. What is the cornerstone of our faith? Jesus. Okay, it's Jesus. Uh, but what about Jesus? What, what about Jesus? It's Jesus' resurrection. Yes, that is the correct answer. So as we go through this tonight, talking about Jesus as the cornerstone, let's understand that that's, that's the, the most important thing about Him. Uh, and we know this because in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, I know you know this scripture, <clears throat> but let's read it anyway. And I'm going to read this out of the uh, Amplified. It says, Because if you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart believe that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes and is so justified, and with the mouth he confesses and declares openly and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. Now, one might won't say, uh, well, but it's that he died for my sin, that that's what's important. Well, that's, that's part of it. I mean, for him to resurrect, he had to die, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a resurrection if there wasn't a death to precede the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And of course... He didn't die for his sins. You know, the wages of sin is death, but he, he knew no sin. So if it wasn't his sin that caused his death, then whose sin was it? Well, it was all on humanity's. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. But anyway, so the resurrection is the, the key. That, that is the, the cornerstone. And we were talking in Ephesians chapter 2 last week. Uh, about how the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, join together at Jesus Christ and how he was in in the Old Covenant he was foreshadowed in fact it said you can you can find something about Jesus on every page of the Old Testament that, that he, he is there he is the word made flesh Okay, but then that would be what it means when it talks about prophets. It says that, that we are built upon a foundation of prophets and the apostles. Well, the apostles were those who knew him personally, his, his disciples that walked with him. Okay, and so those two things uh, are in agreement. Uh, as it says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, You are built. Upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets mm -hmm. with Christ Jesus himself the chief cornerstone and in him the whole structure the whole Bible the whole of God's plan mm -hmm. for humanity the whole thing uh, is welded together harmoniously and it continues to rise and continues to grow so it's not just a historic thing. It's not just, well, okay, that happened 2,000 years ago, and so that, that, uh, that completed the, the process. Well, no, we're still a work in progress. All of us are. But it was founded upon that, uh, that we continue to grow into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. And in Him and in fellowship with one another, you yourselves are being built up into this structure with the rest. See, that puts us uh, in contact, so to speak, with the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles, Peter, James, and John, and Paul, and all of them. We're part of that team. We're all on the same team. We're on God's team, right? It says you, we're being built with them into a fixed abode, a dwelling place of God. See, that's what God 
wants it is to to come back and and rule and reign here on planet earth the way it should have been the first time when he created Adam and Eve. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's talk some more about the importance of Jesus' resurrection. Verse 1, Moreover, and now, let me remind you of the gospel which was proclaimed to you, which you welcomed and accepted, and upon which your faith rests. Now, that's, that's important fact here, is that our faith rests upon something that God has uh, told us. Our faith does not rest upon our own experience. Now, a lot of people think that it does. And okay, they're, they're hearing the gospel at some point in time. Um, they experienced a, a great burden being lifted off their shoulders or, or something. Their life turned around at that point in their life. And so for them, I guess those things are one and the same. That their experience of salvation... Uh, and hearing the gospel uh, coincided. But it can be a problem if you put your faith in something that you have experienced. Because once that feeling or once that sensation subsides, or maybe, you know, life gets complicated and, and time goes on and maybe you end up with another burden on your shoulders that's that's just as grievous as that one that you had back then. It's like, well, did I lose my salvation? Well, if you see, if you think you did, it's because you were putting your faith in your experience and not in what God said. Because remember, faith is in something that's, uh, as far as you're concerned, uh, out there. If you're holding it here in your hand, if it's inside you, and that, then, then that's not out there. Then it says faith is the substance of things not seen. Okay? Now, that's not to say you cannot experience it. You can, and I believe we should. But the point is, don't put your faith in what you have experienced. Put your faith in what God said. And we're going to talk about God talking to us here. Um, anyway, verse 2. <clears throat> the gospel uh, which you accepted and upon which your faith rests and by which you are saved if you hold fast and keep firmly what I preach to you unless you believed at first without effect and for nothing. For I passed on to you, first of all, what I had received that Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, there's several things in here we're going to talk about, but one thing I'm not going to go into detail tonight I'm going to talk about in the next message is the meaning of the word Christ. Okay? Because um, the, the Greek word Christ uh, is, is the word Christos, which comes from a word creo, which actually just literally means to smear with oil. Okay, but the the anointing oil you know, of the Bible was, was a multi-purpose thing, a and this explains, which we'll get into in another message. This explains how and by what method the devil counterfeits. The things of God. Okay, one of the things that that olive oil did back in the day was they used that for fuel for their lamps, right? You know, it, where there's all that, like in Zechariah four, and then in Revelation chapter one, and all these places it talks about a lamp, right? And, and in Zechariah four it talks about well they had these these tubes that connected the olive trees directly into the lamp. Well, and that was to give light. Well, remember in 2 Corinthians, 
uh, chapter 11, it says that uh, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Right? So, Satan has an anointing. So, just because something, just because you get a, an aha moment, or you get a, a sudden boost, or a certain, uh, you know, yay moment uh, from a, an anointing, that doesn't per se prove that that was God. We, we talk about more about that on Sunday, about the counterfeits of, of, of Jesus. But anyway, it says here that he died according to the scriptures. This is, this is really key here. Everything that happened to Jesus was foreshadowed and foretold in the Old Testament. Keep the place here and let's go to Luke chapter 24. See, one of the reasons why uh, many of the Jews in Jesus' time did not think he was the Christ, the anointed one, and why many still don't, is because their notion of what anointing uh, was supposed to do. That, that okay, in, in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, it says that the yoke will be removed from Israel's neck because of the anointing. So the idea was that the anointed one would set you free, would, would remove bondage. Well, uh, doesn't Jesus do that? Well, yes, he does, but they had a preconceived idea that that was going to look a certain way. It would be like, let's say, well, uh, God, God, Jesus is going to set America free from from all the the um, the destruction of the family and, and and all of the the corruption of the government and everything that's happened, <clears throat> you know, he he's gonna gonna restore uh, America to be a godly nation again. And then if we just see it go to hell in a handbasket, like ten times worse than what it already is, it's like, well, God, you let us down. Well. <laughs> You know, he didn't say here specifically he was going to do anything for anybody except those who make a, a commitment, a covenant with him. If my people. Right. And, and even his people. There's some conditions there. Uh, you know, they can't just do willy-nilly what they please. And Well, we're, we're God's people, so God's going to bless us. We can do what we please. Well, no. Anyway, so... Here, Jesus has resurrected from the dead and he's, He meets these people the same day walking down this road and, and He's talking to them. Let's start at verse uh, 15. <clears throat> it says, There were two walking along the road and as they were conversing and discussing together, Jesus Himself, this is the resurrected Jesus, caught up with them and was already accompanying them but their eyes were held, so they did not recognize him. You see, they were already preoccupied, and, and they, you know, they, he even showed up, and they didn't recognize it was him. And he said to them, well, what is this discussion that you're exchanging between yourselves as you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad and downcast. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him and said, well, are you, do you alone dwell as a stranger in Jerusalem and not know the things that have occurred there in these days? Mm -hmm. And he said to them, well, what kind of things? And they said, well, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet mighty in work and word and before God and all the people. <clears throat> and how our chief priests and rulers gave him up and sentenced him to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem and set Israel free. Well, now, are we going to say that Jesus did not redeem Israel? No, we're not going to say that. <clears throat> but redeeming Israel is a, looks a lot different than what they were expecting it to look like. Okay? So, and besides this, it's the third day since these things occurred. <clears throat> And moreover, some women in our company astounded us and drove us out of our senses. 
they were at the tomb early, but they did not find his body. And they returned saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And so some of those who were with us, <clears throat> we went to the tomb and we found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. <clears throat> well, and Jesus said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe everything that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary and essentially fitting that the Christ, that's the anointed one. Remember, the one who's supposed to break the yoke. Yeah. The scripture said that the one who's supposed to break the yoke <clears throat> must first suffer. <clears throat> and all of those things before entering into his glory. And then beginning with Moses and throughout all the prophets, he went on explaining and interpreting to them in all the scriptures the things concerning and referring to himself. So you see how the prophets are kind of angling up here at Jesus being the cornerstone, right? Yeah. Okay, go back to... Um, 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> In verse 3, it says that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And there are a lot of scriptures. Isaiah 53, for example, that tells us all about that. And then verse 4, that he was buried and that he arose on the third day as the scriptures foretold. Well, there's a couple of things here <clears throat> that we need to be sure that we're clear on because uh, Christendom has had a, a lot of a lot of uh, differences of opinion about some of this. First of all, <clears throat> who did Jesus die for? Uh, well, you and everybody. Everybody. Okay, that was the answer. I was, I was, I was just. I, I know that was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he died for everybody. Everybody should say me. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, your your strict five point Calvinists don't believe that. The L of their tulip, that's their third point, is that the atonement was only limited to those who were foreordained for salvation. Well, that's not exactly what the scriptures say. Exactly. exactly. Okay, let's go. To, let me let me show you this first. Just so you just so you won't let the devil talk you out of your salvation. <clears throat> uh, first, John chapter two, verse one. Little children. Now, in, in 1 John chapter 2, there's three classes of people that he talks to, and really all of them apply to everybody. There's the little children, there's the young men, and then there's the fathers. And all this is, is pointing out is that there is a process in, in the realm of, of spiritual growth. Okay? And, and uh, it's like Owen Cain told me in 1978, whatever you know about God, there's more. All right? But he's saying, when he's talking to little children, it's kind of like, okay, this is the starting place. And get, get this straight before you go anywhere else. Make sure you have this in your foundation. Little children, I write these things to you so that you may not violate God's law and sin. But <clears throat> you might. <laughs> and said, and if anyone should sin, we have an advocate, one who will intercede for us with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the all-righteous who conforms to the Father's will in every purpose, thought, and action. Praise God. We have a friend in Jesus. And, and he, he'll, if we fail, he picks us up. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now watch this next sentence. And not ours alone. Well, who's ours? Who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. He said he didn't just die for the sins of Christians, 
but for the sins of the whole world. Well, Ray, are you saying universal salvation? No, I'm not. But what I'm saying is that the whole world could be saved if they will believe in His resurrection. That's the problem. That, that's that's the, the basis of faith right there. We read it in Romans 10, didn't we? He said, if you believe that Jesus died for you and He rose again, you'll be saved. That, that's all you have to do. And, but see, not everybody is going to do that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But see, He didn't just die for Christians, but for the sins of the whole world. Or did I read that wrong? Okay, how about 1 Peter chapter 3? Verse 18. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah himself, died for sins once for all. Does that leave anybody out? Well, it kind of leaves out the whosoever's that won't. But as far as he's concerned, it was for everybody. I mean, he even prayed for those that were crucifying him. He said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right? So, he died once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. <clears throat> the just for the unjust the innocent for the guilty, that he might bring us to God <clears throat> in his human body he was put to death. But he was made alive in the spirit in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He didn't go to hell to suffer under Satan like there's a myth that has been out there in charismatic Christianity for years. He preached to the spirits in prison the souls of those who long before in the days of Noah <clears throat> had been disobedient. When God's patience waited during the building of the ark in which a few people actually ate in number were saved through water. Well, that tells you something interesting. There's only eight people saved, but he preached, Noah preached to everybody that would hear him. Yeah. So there was salvation for those people too. It was in the grave. <clears throat> I mean, look at the mercy of God in that. You know, prob probably uh, Noah's grandfather Methuselah might have been in that bunch. You know, men that lived the longest that it's recorded in the Bible other than the ones that didn't die. Uh, verse 21, and baptism which is a figure, a, a, a metaphor, if you will, does now save you from inward questionings and fears, not by the removing of outward bodily filth, or by bathing, but by providing you with a good, clear conscience toward God because you are demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, what does being baptized have to do with resurrection? When you're put under the water, you're buried. When you come out of the water, you're resurrected. All right? That's why that's so important when you come to the Lord that you, that you submit to that so that you will understand that you are uh, to be resurrected, that you are a new creature when you have faith in Jesus Christ. If you if you think, well, I've got faith in Jesus Christ, but I'm still still the same old sinner that I used to be, and it's just I got to get out of hell free card. Well, then you're <clears throat> you haven't appreciated what your baptism was supposed to tell you, right? Okay, um, let's go to. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. A couple of things more I want to say there. <coughs> Verse uh, 12. But now if Christ the Messiah is preached as 
being raised from the dead. How is it that some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, we know from what it tells us in the Scriptures other places that there was a sect of, of uh, Jewish leaders called Sadducees who uh, denied that there was any resurrection of the dead. Yeah. Now, a couple of things, a couple of interesting things about that. Number one, that word Sadducee actually in Hebrew means they they were they they were the right thinking ones. They were the ones, or at least they took that title for themselves. That they're the ones that had it right. Well, think about modern man. Think about modern scientifically minded, secular, humanistic man. They don't believe in resurrection. They don't even believe in supernatural. That's all woo stuff. That's all magic. You know, that's all uh, witchcraft or something. You know, it's like, oh, well, no, it's all, it's all, you know, physical, tangible, atomic, uh, you know, it's just maybe there's stuff we don't understand because we don't have a, a microscope powerful enough to see it at that level. But it's all there in the, in the physical, in the tangible. There is no spirit realm. Well, see, that. listen, that is the way that, that the power in this world works. That, that, that's, that, that's how this world is set up, uh, predicated upon that assumption that it is physical. And, and anything spiritual is like, well, okay, that's your opinion, and you believe this, and the Wiccans believe that, and the Buddhists believe this, and the Muslims believe that. And okay, it's all okay as long as you don't impose your way upon me, upon everybody else. But, but otherwise, if I can't uh, you know, touch it, uh, hear it, see it, smell it, taste it, uh, then as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. That, that, that is physical. Okay? And so, there, you know, back then, there were even those that were saying, well, what does it matter if you say this guy uh, it, that died, well, then he's, he's alive again? Oh, well, that can't be. That's what Paul's talking about. He said, well, but if there is no res resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. Or worse than that, our preaching is a fable. Mm -hmm. Right? And your faith is devoid of truth and is fruitless. And we are even discovered to be misrepresenting God. For we have testified that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, in the case is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is mere delusion and you are still in your sins. So what is it that delivered us from our sins? Resurrection. His resurrection. You know, some would say, well, it, but he, it was his crucifixion. I mean, it's like that was our sin that put him there. Well, you know, Jesus is not the only human being that's ever been put up on a cross. I mean, there were those two thieves that were, were there next to him. And, and uh, plenty of good men have been executed unjustly. In fact, in the fifth chapter of Romans, it talks about, says, well, you know, you might, you might even be willing to lay your life down for, for a good person. People, you know, soldiers do that for their country all the time. They go lay their life down because they... They love their people and they, they, they want to see their nation preserved, but, but that, didn't, that didn't carry your sin, did it? And, and your faith, and if, even if you did believe that, you believe, well, well okay, God's going to accept me because of, of all the, the great patriots of American history who died for my freedom. You think that's going to get you into heaven? It is not going to get you into heaven because those people had sin. And so they could not be a perfect sacrifice for you. They might have been as good a sacrifice as the United States of America needed at the time to save us from Hitler and from who knows what all else. But that doesn't save you from hell. The only thing that can save you from hell is a perfect sacrifice. And that was God himself becoming a man and dying. But he proved that he was the perfect sacrifice by rising from the dead. Right? Anybody else would have stayed dead. <laughs> right? Okay, so it's the resurrection. 
But see, and without the resurrection, you're still under the power of your sins. Uh, verse 20, but the fact is that Christ, the Messiah, has been raised from the dead, and he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since it was through a man that death came into the world, that's Adam, of course, then it is also through the man, Jesus, that the resurrection of the dead has come. Well, what does that tell us? That Jesus ain't the only one that gets to experience resurrection. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's talk about that just a little bit. Go to Acts chapter... You don't have to place it in 1 Corinthians. Go. Go to Acts chapter 17. Okay. Acts what? 17. It's one of your favorite chapters, Bobby. Okay. Oh, yeah. Acts 17, verse 24. I think I remember you telling me that one time. Find the facts in the book of Acts. <laughs> I, did you, I did tell you that I remember it. I remember. Okay. Uh, Acts 17, verse 24. Now, Paul had a, a layover, I guess. He was, he was waiting for a for a, for a plane to take him to, to Asia Minor. He had a layover in Athens, and so he had some time on his hands, and so he went down to the marketplace and started talking to some people about Jesus, and he found out something interesting about the people of Athens. They were more sophisticated than your average bear. It said that they, they were on top of the news. They knew what was going on. They weren't in some little podunk town somewhere that they and you know they were just going about life as usual. I mean they they were you know they had CNN going all the time or Fox News take your pick, all right and 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 they were well educated, you know and that was their culture. You know I'm not saying that to, that's anything about their personality. I mean just that's the way it was in Athens, you know it it was. Uh, it was a very sophisticated place. But I want you to see that, that God can minister in a place like that Amen. too. Okay? Amen. Verse 24. So here's what Paul says. And he says, The God who produced and formed the world and all things in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in handmade shrines. So first of all, he's, he's acknowledging the transcendence and the existence of God. And he's acknowledging the spirit realm. So he's saying there's more to it than just the physical. And then he says, neither is he served by human hands. Which is kind of like it says in Ephesians, we're not saved by our works. Well, see, the, the more a man knows, the more a man thinks he has to do if not to earn salvation, at least to, uh, to have a comfortable life, right? I mean, that, that's kind of always been the, you know, when, when, when uh, I was a young man in school, and, and, you know, of course, my parents were teachers, so of course they'd say something like this, but I think it was the way people thought back in the 50s and 60s. It's like, well, you want to get the best education you can so you get a job, a good job, so you can have enough money to feed yourself and your family. That it's like that's the purpose of, of, of learning. And what's wrong with that? I mean, it, if that really works, the problem is, is it doesn't work. I mean, you ask any college student today that's got hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of uh, college loans and they're, they're, uh, they're pulling coffee at a Starbucks somewhere. Yeah. Right. So that, that was a lie, <laughs> but it was a good idea. Okay? And I will say this, you, college is not the only place you can learn things. You can learn things on a job, but you might only better learn something if you're going to be useful in this world. If you're just, uh, you know, that those are the people that the, the high muckety mucks want to, uh, you know, wipe out so they can have this place for themselves. You owe it to yourself to know as much as you can know. Just saying. Anyway, so he said that he's not served by human hands as though he lacked anything, for it is he himself who gives life and breath and all things to all people. And he made from one common origin 
all nations of men to settle on the face of the earth. Now, if everybody would believe that and put that into practice, we wouldn't have all the racial strife that this world is full of. Okay? And he has definitely determined their allotted periods of time and fixed boundaries of their habitation. You know, it's not going to be the stars and stripes forever, folks. There, there, there's limits. God, God says, okay, when you get to this place here, uh, that's enough. And he's done that over and over and over throughout history. Okay, so, but he has a reason for that. He said he's fixed the boundaries of their habitation so that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. Although he's not far from each of us. But for in him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said. He was talking about Greek poets. He was talking about, you know, Sophocles and, and Euripides and all those other Pades guys that were, that were alive there. And they were not Christians. They were not Jews. But they were recognizing that there was a spiritual dimension to life, that there was a God, and, and that, that all of nature uh, proved that, like it says in the first chapter of Romans. Okay, since then we are God's offspring, we ought not to suppose that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone or a or representation of human art or imagination or anything that can be constructed or invented, not even a a cathedral or a, or a mega church or a chapel or, or, or a, a crucifix or you know any of the other things that people do that they think somehow uh, this is going to uh, please God. Well he doesn't need that. He's got the cattle on a thousand hills. Mm -hmm. right? So he, do, he doesn't need our stuff in order to show that he exists. It says that the heavens declare his glory. Anyway, mm -hmm. such Former ages of ignorance, God, it is true, ignored and allowed to pass unnoticed. But now he charges all people everywhere to repent, to change their minds for the better and heartily amend their ways with abhorrence for their past sins. You know, there's only there's only one thing. <clears throat> okay, this this does say the right, okay, God. This is not chapter and verse. But I still think I'm right. Okay, there's one thing that brings a person to salvation. Oh, there might be all kinds of different circumstances in life that happen when somebody turns to God, to, to Jesus, and accepts Him as their Savior. But it all boils down to one thing. They're tired of the life they're living. They're, they're, they are wanting a change. If you're not wanting to change, you're not going to get it. I remember Merrill Ellis, my music composition teacher at North Texas, he said this about, about music techniques and composing. He said, you will not learn a new technique until you decide you need it. And a person will not accept Jesus as their Savior until they have decided that's what they need. And, and see, that's that's why, you know, that's why the way is, is broad that leads to destruction because most people have found something that kind of works for them and, and they'll stay with that. Thomas Jefferson even said that in the Declaration of Independence when he's talking about why that they wanted to, uh, you know, separate themselves from the British Empire. He said, well, hey, you know, prudence has shown that people will put up with all kinds of unpleasant situations as long as it's easier to do that than to break free. But, it's, but when you get to a certain place that you are in slavery, then your only alternative is to revolt. Well, see, that's, people can get you know, messed up in the things of life, and they can, they can tolerate it. You can get addicted to heroin and even you know, still function. There's all kinds of famous musicians and, and actors and people like that who, they, they, they were able to function with that. But sooner or later, you get to a place where you realize, I am enslaved. I, you know, I, I, I can't function this way. 
See, that's the first step of 12-step programs, is to realize, hey, my life is unmanageable in its current state. Now, I don't believe that 12-step programs uh, necessarily lead a person to Jesus, but it's at that, you have to get to that place where you decide, I don't like life the way it is now. I need something better. And when you get to that place, Jesus is there to give you that. I, I know I'm talking to somebody listening to this tonight. Anyway, because uh, that's he's called everybody to repent. Because he has fixed a day when he will judge the world righteously by a man whom he has designated and appointed for that task, and that's Jesus. And he has made this credible and given conviction and assurance and evidence to everyone by raising him from the dead. Wow. Now, verse 32 describes the reaction that he got there. And remember, he was, this was at a place called the, the Mars Hill Auditorium. And this was, this was where the philosophers of, of, of Athens gathered to, to conduct debates. I mean, there was some, some uh, you know, probably Cicero and people like, no, he was in Rome. But so, some of the, the famous philosophers were probably there listening to Paul talking here. <clears throat> and then it said, now when they heard that there had been a resurrection from the dead, some scoffed. See, this is, this is the problem. Now let me say, there's more to that a little closer to home. We as Christians need to always be open and seeking God to supernaturally intervene. I'm not saying that, that you know, there won't be natural blessings. I mean, I do thank God for the food that I eat and I thank God for the money that is in my bank account. But you know, those things can only go so far. And then, then we have to have God be supernatural. And you know, and there's another, another place up there in uh, 1 Corinthians where Paul says, well, if, if it's only in this life that we have hope, then, then we're to be pitied. But see, these people, they, they were so materialistic, just like modern American uh, successful people today are. It's like, well, you know, they, they don't need God. They, you know, so they don't need something supernatural. They just want what they can hold in their hand. They scoffed. But others said, well, we will hear you again about this. Mm. And so Paul went out from among them. But some men were on his side and joined him mm. and believed and became Christians. Mm. And among them was Dionysius, a judge of the Areopagus. I mean, he was, you know, a chairman of the school board there. And, and a woman named Damaris and some others with him. So, I want you to see that um, the, the only requirement uh, to receive the things of God is just you need to be hungry. It doesn't say you need to be poor. It doesn't say you need to be rich. It doesn't say, say you need to be black or you need to be white. You just need to be hungry. Okay, now there's several, I don't want to take too much time here, but there's several metaphors in the scripture that speak of resurrection as types and shadows. Okay, first of all, go to Numbers chapter 17. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and get from them rods, sticks, okay? One from each father's house, from all their leaders according to their father's houses, receive rods and write every man's name on his rod. And you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. And you shall lay them up in the tent of meeting before the ark of the testimony where I meet with you. And the rod of the man whom I choose shall bud. 
and I will make to cease from me the murmuring of the Israelites which murmur against you. And Moses spoke to the Israelites, and every of each one of the leaders gave him a rod or a staff, one for each leader according to their father's houses, twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses deposited the rods of the Lord in the tent of testimony. And the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and brought forth buds and produced blossoms and yielded almonds. Now there's an interesting thing about the almond tree according to my <coughs> dictionaries is that in Israel the almond tree will, will bloom and produce fruit before any other plant does. It's like it, it's still winter time and it's already putting out its blooms and then it's already putting out the nuts even before, you know, uh, apples or, or any of the other, uh, you know, fruit bearing plants. And as a type and shadow of resurrection, I, I see there, there's two things being shown here. First of all, is um, God knows those who are his and he endorses them. You know, so so whenever you are criticized, whenever you are, uh, you know, scoffed at, whenever you you are uh, put down, um, God is going to vindicate you supernaturally. And it's not, you know, we don't have to do it ourselves. Um, yeah, and, and what is going to what is going to vindicate? It's it's all of these things here. It's the blossom. It's the fruit like the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith, and, and, and the blossom, which is like the, the joy of the Lord that is our strength, and all of those things God brings forth to, to, to validate us uh, in the face of our critics. God does it. And that is a form of resurrection. See, because they put a dead stick in there in the tent of meeting. They, they brought a dead stick to God. And what did He produce out of that? Right? Okay, go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, one could say, well, yeah, but that was just to validate the tribe of Levi. That was just to validate the priestly tribe so all of the other tribes wouldn't get to uppity and think that they could, you know, uh, say how the cow ate the cabbage. Well, okay, under the old, old covenant, that was the way that it worked, although it didn't really work that well either because the Levites ended up being just as corrupt as ever all the rest of them were sometimes even worse but God intends to to bring new life to that which you bring to him Ezekiel 37 let me just kind of read this down and then we'll close the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones well, why do you have bones in a valley? Because a bunch of stuff has died. Yeah. All right? And he caused me to pass around among them, and behold, there were very <laughs> many human bones in the open valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? <laughs> and I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Well, prophesy to these bones and say to them, Oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So what brings the new life? <coughs> the word of the Lord. Okay? And thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath and spirit, like Holy Spirit, to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you that's like muscles and what, what can you do if you have muscles 
you can lift things, which is like what that word, the man-child in Revelation 12 means, strong for lifting, okay? And I will put flesh upon you and cover you with skin, and I will put breath and spirit in you, and you shall live, and you shall know and understand that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a thundering noise. And behold, a shaking and a trembling and a rattling. You know, that's going on in our world. And, and it says in Hebrews that everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. But that's a good thing. See, because it's because of that that God's bringing His true church together. And it says in Isaiah that it's when the judgments of the Lord are in the earth that the inhabitants of the earth are going to learn righteousness. Right? And may, that may be what it'll take to, to get them to be hungry for God. Anyway, and I looked. Well, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews upon the flesh. And upon them skin covered over them, but there was no breath or spirit in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath and spirit, son of man, and say to the breath and spirit, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath and spirit, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath and spirit came into the bones, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Reminds me of that group in Revelation 7 that came out of the great tribulation. I mean, you talk about coming out of shaking. I mean, that, that, that's the, the worst. It says that's the worst time in human history. But they were saved. I don't know that I'd like to get saved under those conditions, but there are those that do. In verse 11, he said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. Yeah, I, You know, I'm just going to say, I don't think you have to be in the house of Israel to say that. <laughs> you know, I think some Christians kind of get to that place that they say, oh, this... This has gone on and on and on, and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Same verse, same song, second verse. Uh, anyway, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. And of course, literally that will be fulfilled in, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, when the, at the seventh trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise. And then those who are alive and remain will be caught up with them. But I believe there's, there's a more general application of that. There are graves. There are things in our lives that are as good as dead. And God says, I'm going to take that and do something new with it. I'm going to resurrect it. But it's going to be new. It's going to be different. It's going to be better. Right? Cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. And then you will know and understand and realize that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it. Now we've seen that somewhat fulfilled in modern times with the return of the Jews that were scattered throughout the earth to the land of Israel. So that much of it has been done. But the part about the, uh, the, the breath and spirit, the spirit of the Lord being breathed into them, that has not happened yet on, on any kind of grand scale. I mean, there are... There are those Jews that are believers in Jesus. There, I'm thinking of like Stephen Ben Danun and, J and Yana Ben Danun, for example. But they're, they're few and far between at this particular time. But this is what resurrection is about. This is what resurrection is is to do: is to fulfill. 
God's original plan and purpose for humanity in the first place because He didn't want them to die. <clears throat> and He even says that in, in Ezekiel 33. I think He said, well, why should you die? You know, he said, I, I don't, I don't, God says, I don't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't want us to die either. So Father, I thank You for resurrection. I thank You for the hope that, that is ours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I, and I thank You, Father, that those things that we have thought were just dead and gone and, and useless and hopeless, that, that You are a God of resurrection and that, that You will bring new life where, where things were old and dead and dry and cut off. And Father, I thank You that, that You know the heart of every person and You, and you know <clears throat> You know that more than anything else that, that we want to, to please you and, and, and to fulfill your plan and purpose in our lives.